So what if I told you, you don't have to sit alone in grief anymore? This is Natasha Smith, and you are listening to the Can You Just Sit With Me podcast. Today, I'm so excited to be sitting with Sarah Bell. She is a grief educator and the creator of Life, Loss, and Hope. Her experiences of personal loss, faith, and working as a hospice chaplain with terminally ill, end-of-life, and bereaved families informs and inspires her work. I'm so excited for you to have the opportunity to hear from her. So come and sit with us and join the conversation. I am just so excited just to be sitting with my dear friend, Sarah, and we're going to just jump right in. I want to ask you this question. Can you tell us about a moment in life, in your life, when you wanted to ask someone the question, can you just sit with me? Well, that's just such a great question. And, you know, I think it's taken decades of my life to actually have that question just able and ready in my mind. But certainly two years ago, or actually two years ago, my brother was suddenly and tragically killed in a mountaineering accident. And for the first time, after many, many losses, that was just the question that I wanted to say to people. Can you just sit with me? Can you just hold that space? Can you just hear me? Can you just see me? Can you just feel my pain and yet not try to fix me, not try to reach out to touch me, to hold me? But just sit with me and, yeah, just sit and hold that space. And so it took me many decades, Natasha, to actually allow myself the, yeah, just the the real healing power of just someone sitting with me and knowing that's what I needed. Uh, It was just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love how, how you... You said it took time. It took decades for you it to come to that. And so, yeah, decades. I mean, really, the first loss that I had was my mother when I was only 24. Um, she had a very sudden aggressive brain tumor. I was pregnant with my first child and really didn't know what to expect. But, you know, God had really kind of gone ahead of me and prepared me for what was going to happen. In many ways, it was just an incredible journey, but it was very sudden. And I nursed her all the way through, moving back in with my father, and I nursed her all the way through, and I was there actually when she died. And so for me, you know, loss came very early in life, and it was, I had a very supernatural experience as, as she died, and it really was one of my first tastes of heaven. Wow. And it just was a profound impact on my life, but I didn't know how to grieve. Yes. Yes. And I feel like that is, that is most of our story. (laughs) We don't, we don't know how, we didn't know how, we don't know how. And by the grace of God, he, he helped us and he showed us the way. Because my story is similar in that 30, it took me decades to come to this point of realization of me just needing someone to just sit with me. And so I want to, you, you just mentioned some of your story of how you lost your mom at an early age and, and the loss of your brother. Can you just kind of take us back and just tell us your story and then how it came to kind of inform the wonderful work that you do? Yeah, of course. So so that was the first, you know, really major loss that I had. My, my father had been ill when I was 19 and he had a very serious cancer. So I, I kind of thought that he was going to pass first, but he had an amazing recovery. And then just years later, my mom got ill and it was only a very, very short time. And, and as I said, she died. And when she died, I was with her and there was just this enormous sense of peace. And even then I knew that as I was talking to her in those last hours that she could hear me suddenly when she passed, you know, I saw this kind of helix white ribbon of, of light just going from her, almost from her head upwards. Um, It was such a realization that her spirit had been released from her body. And I didn't understand it, Natasha, until even two weeks ago. Mm. So two weeks ago, I was actually in Kenya on some mission work. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about our bodies being healed. And 
I was remembering that the epicenter of every cell in our body contains laminin, which is a cross-shaped, light kind of helix thing. And in that moment, I had the revelation that that life resurrection power is what passed from my mother into heaven. Wow. So I witnessed that at, at a very early age. And then it shaped, you know, so many other things. But I, I didn't know how to grieve. I thought I had to be strong. You know, I was a Christian. I had to sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. She's not here. And right. that's, I really felt I had to be the strong one, the counselor. That's what my job was. And I just buried it. And also then I went on to have two pregnancy losses, which, you know, it was really tough. But I ended up out of five pregnancies, having three beautiful daughters. And then after that, I lost many friends. And so I always seemed to be at the scene of somebody passing or being looking after some elderly person at church who had nobody else. And it was just like God was always preparing me to be there in those yeah. moments. And then I also very sadly lost a very long marriage. And for me, that was one of the biggest griefs. And I know when I do videos and, and I talk, people actually think that my first husband died and it's not something that I talk about a lot, but actually he left. I was very badly betrayed. And so, you know, the, the, it never occurred to me that that was actually a bereavement until years later, but it was probably one of the hardest, toughest losses because there was no closure. There was no, not that there's ever any closure in grief, but because I would still see him and see him with somebody else, mm. it was just fresh all the time and come back and back and back. And so that was a very, you know, tough loss as well. And then most recently, the unexpected death of my brother. So, you know, my story is peppered with loss, but also peppered with restoration, redemption, hope. and. Romans 8, 28 is written like, I don't know if you have it in America, but we have like a stick of rock, like candy, mm -hmm. yeah. and you can buy it when you go to various places. And in the middle of the rock, it has the place, as you break it, it has the place. So it might say Brighton Rock in pink letters, and it's like a souvenir. So I, I think that every part of my life has got that written mm -hmm. in Romans 8, 28, that God works all things for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Yes. And not all things are good. You know, right. that. of course, it's not good. Nothing's good about any of those losses. But his redemption and his restoration is, to me, just phenomenal. And to see how he makes something purposeful out of our pain and, and that has really inspired the work that I do now. Yes. Oh, I love that so much. You said so many things. One thing that I, that I caught was just the different types of losses, of yeah. course, that, that we typically haven't been aware of or mm -hmm. made known or learned about. Like we, we just thought that, you know, when someone died, that was, that was loss and that is grief. But as you mentioned, it can be a divorce. It can be, it can be so many things. And that's, I, I, I love that we're able to make space for all the different type of losses that we, we experience in life. I think the Tlatcher, yeah, it is so right. And my, my passion now is to educate people with grief because I think what we call those ambiguous losses mm. are probably the hardest ones. You know, the losses that society judges minimizes or tries to sweep under the carpet. So you really feel like when I first, I lost the first child, their uh, first pregnancy, I felt such a lot of shame because I didn't think I should be grieving. I didn't think I should feel as bad as I did. And so I kind of hid it even from my husband, you know, I hid books underneath the sofa. I didn't want anybody to see how bad I felt. I felt so guilty. Yeah. And people would say things like, oh, don't worry, you've already had another child. You're young, you can have another child. But for me, that pregnancy was um, a, a baby in my arms. It was a child going to school. You know, it's the whole life of that child. From the moment you see that blue line on the stick that says you're pregnant, you've got a baby in your arms. And 
And so learning about ambiguous loss and how to validate that as, as loss, as real bereavement is a, a big part of the work that I do now. Um, and yeah, just to really validate that actually every loss is someone's worst loss. Yes. And, and also ways to market Natasha. So eventually, you know, I went out in the garden one day and I bought a little pair of white booties and I dug a hole and I buried them in the garden. And I had a little ceremony to that child that oh, wow. would never meet. And I did that all on my own. I couldn't even do it at the time of my husband because of the guilt that I felt, but that really helped. So I encourage people now to to mark and to make a ceremony over any type of loss. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that really does help to say that it matters. It really matters. Mm. Oh yeah, ambiguous loss is a big one. I think particularly with divorce, particularly with the church's teachings around divorce, you know, there's whole doctrines. I mean, that's a whole nother subject that I'd love to talk about. But there's whole doctrines that have been built wrongly after divorce, saying that if you remarry, you are adulterous. But having studied all of those scriptures right back to rabbinic law, the truth is that Jesus was actually talking to a group of women whose husbands were away at war. Hmm. They were probably starving. They were probably wanting to know how to feed their children. And Jesus, what can I do? Can I remarry? They'd been away at war for ages. And Jesus said, if you remarry, you could be adulterous. Now that changes the whole debt. <laughs> yes. Because in, in that case, he was right. You, they didn't know the husbands were living or dead, but actually if your marriage finishes by a divorce or death, there is absolutely no reason at all not to remarry. And, you know, for me, my story of redemption there is amazing. <laughs> you know, God has now given me a wonderful Christian husband who we do mission, we do loads of things together and, you know, has empowered us as a couple for the kingdom. So part of his restoration. Wow, so beautiful. So beautiful. I feel like we should have did like part one, two, three of, of this episode. Oh my gosh. It's just so powerful and so many nuggets of wisdom here. We need you to come back on the podcast for another yeah, episode. I think it's actually the, whole, the whole subject matter for people who have been, you know, divorced that really need this message. Yes. Actually, those teachings have been taken out of context and we need to be empowered. You know, we need to be empowered as women, to be with a godly man for, for, for marriage, for kingdom, because yes. two are better than one. Yeah. So, yeah, that's another part of my story. Yeah. So I wanted to, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but I want to um, talk about how, just how your story of loss and you navigating it, how does that inform your work? What is the work that you do? I know that you have been a chaplain. And so I just want you to just tell us how, how God has moved you to to help others in this area yeah so initially in my my professional work I was a speech and language pathologist and then I had I had quite an epiphany and I changed I did theology and then I retrained and I have been a hospice chaplain so I've been working with people at the end of life um, and in bereavement and grief for six years prior and then I left and, you know, it was God's time. It was right at the end of COVID. So I worked all the way through COVID with that. And, you know, my own loss really inspired that because, you know, when you're still standing and you're able to use your pain for purpose, you become, you carry the light, you know, you become a beacon of hope that people can see that you've survived these things. Not that we share all of our story, but sometimes it's appropriate to say, well, you know, I, I, I do know, I hear you. I was, you know, my, I lost my mother too when I was, yeah, very young. So it has really inspired my, my change of career. And then when I left, I, I realized that there was so much in grief and loss that weren't, wasn't talked about. The feelings that are less acceptable, like guilt, like anger, you know, what do we do with all of this? And how do we navigate grief as, with, as being a Christian, holding the yeah. duality of life and death and actually the the joy of knowing that someone's in heaven, but also the pain and the agony here on earth 
And it seemed to me that that was all out of kilter. So holding the duality of, yes, it hurts here, but actually how can we express our grief in a healthy way um, became something that I really wanted to talk about. And that's when I started Life Lost Hope. Um, the videos that I do, um, just to tackle subjects that I knew people would find really difficult to talk about from my work. As I was filming the very first videos, that was actually when I got the phone call about my brother. So I really have had to, I've had to walk the walk of my own grief as I've talked about guilt, as I've talked about anger, as I've talked about the ruminations of guilt the physical things, the emotional things. And so in God's timing, you know, that's that he's used all of that as well. Mm -hmm. So hopefully when people hear me, they hear me from a place that I'm with you, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but in, well, since I've probably last communicated with you, I'm actually back at the hospice. Um, so they they asked me to go back to to redo my job. So I'm now back as a chaplain at the hospice. And I just feel I've got a whole armory now of grief education, which I did with David Kessler last year. I did his training course. And so it's like I'm back supercharged yes. um, and ready just to hold space and be with people at the end of life and also the families as they grieve. And do funerals. So we were talking about how, you know, just how loss and grief that you've experienced informs your work now. And now mm -hmm. you're back in doing hospice as a hospice chaplain. I wanted to, because as you're talking, you know, me for in the U.S., we can hear your accent. <laughs> and so I was just curious if you found or if, if, there is, if, if you notice some differences between like West, Western culture and like, have you noticed differences in like U.S. versus U.K. as it relates to loss and, and how is, you know, talked about or not talked about, or is it kind of similar all over? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's very similar. I have a lot of friends from the U.S., you know, from the, some of the mission work we've done with Joyce Meyer. Yeah. You, probably, you know, probably know Joyce Meyer with part of her Hand of Hope outreach. So I, I have a lot of friends in the U.S. And I have a friend who is widowed who's actually coming to stay next week with us. And I would say her experience of loss and grief have been universally similar. And having just returned, we've been to Kenya and Ethiopia recently on mission. I would say over there, even though they can express some of the lamenting, it's probably even more tight in terms of grief and loss than it is here, which is actually quite surprising. Yeah. So I think universal, universally there's a societal um, similarities that people don't want to talk about it. They want to bright side you. They want to move you forward. They think that grief is contained in the first few months, just that sad time after somebody and they and people generally, I think, probably over the globe, don't realize that early grief is considered the first two years. That's quite a shocking concept for people. And certainly in the work that I do now, you know, when you say to people that early grief is considered up to the first two years, you can see them visibly. Oh, you know, I'm not going crazy. It's okay to feel not okay. It's okay to feel all of this stuff. Um, so when I do training, I often start with that question to people, how long, you know, how long would you expect somebody to be grieving for? And people often say even weeks, wow, three months, six months, nobody ever says two years is early grieving. And as we know, grieving still then goes on and on, but it changes and it transforms and it transcends. And yeah, I think. I don't know if it gets any lighter, but certainly we get heavier. We, I don't know if it gets any lighter, but certainly our legs get stronger to carry it. You know, our hearts grow to contain it. So I don't think there's many changes. I think it's across the globe. I think we need more conversations yeah. about grief, healthy grieving, and and how to and how to sit with people. And I love the title of your book. Thank you. <laughs> yes. 
if I was thinking, well, I have been thinking of writing one and I, well, I would like, I love that title, obviously. You've got that title. Exactly. Yeah. So much in my heart now because even yesterday at the hospice, I just sat with someone, mm. you know, and sometimes people you just want you to sit in their sadness. Yeah. Particularly when they're terminally ill, you know, there's so much loss even before death. Right. Loss of identity, loss of hope, loss of knowing that you're not going to be with your grandchildren. And sometimes I say to people, I'm just going to sit with you in your sadness. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you can sit in silence and it's so powerful. Just, I'm here, I'm sitting with you in this sadness. And yeah. Yeah. So good. And, and I mean, the work that you're doing is just such a, a needed work. It's a heavy work. You know, God has surely graced you to do so. And I, I'm just so honored just, again, just to have conversations and sit with you today concerning this. I wanted to touch on this. So in, in the U.S., we have Mother's Day. Our Mother's Day is will be in May. May, yeah. Yeah. And I think UK is, was yours in March? Like, did it just have Ours was just on Sunday, Sunday yeah, Sunday. So when we think about Mother's Day without mom, mm -hmm. you know, how, how did you navigate um, that time frame? So I want to just, I want to allow space for you to kind of tell us how you navigated Mother's Day and just the time frame and season of that without your mom and, and what you can tell others who will be navigating mm -hmm. without mom. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha. Yes, I mean, it's changed over the years. In the first years, it was just so raw that I, I really couldn't celebrate. You know, I didn't feel like celebrating when I had my own children. And I think this is a really important thing that I say to young moms is, you know, when I had my own children, people thought, well, it's okay. You don't need to miss your mom because you've got your children. You know, it's Mother's Day for your children. But what I always say to young moms Actually, it's Mother's Day for your children, but actually for you, Mother's Day is still difficult because you don't have your own mom. And I think people can often feel guilty about that. If they've got their own children, they think I shouldn't still be missing my mom because it's their Mother's Day, but actually it's okay to miss your mom. And yeah, I mean, I've been through lots of heartache when it was very, when it was very raw. It's now a long time ago. So now... I actually choose to lean into it and I celebrate. I buy her favorite flowers. She used to love freesias. I, I just really honor her memory. And I spend time with my family and all of the children, all of the grandchildren. We've got five children, seven grandchildren, eight, one on the way. And so, you know, we spend time together. I intentionally think about her and I think about her with more love than pain now, but that's over decades of time. And certainly for the first 12 years, I couldn't even go there. I couldn't celebrate. I, I didn't feel anything. I didn't even cry because I didn't know how to grieve. Yeah. But what I've learned now is I've learned the buffalo approach. So a buffalo, you know, when there's a storm coming, a buffalo is one of the few animals that actually, all the animals run away, you know, they hide in the bush or the, undergrowth or they run to the hills but a buffalo just stands there. Mm. and the buffalo actually faces the storm because it intuitively knows that if it faces the storm and feels the full impact of it that it will pass sooner and for me that has been healthy grieving with my brother so when I heard the news about my brother brother I lamented I cried I cried I asked all the questions. I ranted at God. I ranted at everybody. I told my story to whoever would listen. I was like the buffalo. And I just kept saying to Graham, I'm the buffalo, you know, and I felt it. And I allowed myself to go through all of that. I took time off work. And for me, that was the first time I had really healthily grieved and felt okay about it. And I said to him, just sit with me. And it is, to me, that is the approach now. I try to encourage others to go through if they're ready for it. Sometimes we're not ready to face it. But when you can face it, if you face it fully and allow yourself to feel whatever you feel, 
and to cry and to do all of that stuff. Take time to grieve. It's so important. I do think that is the healthy biblical way as well. When you look at Psalms and you look at Lamentations, it's that pattern. And even being angry, angry with God, it doesn't mean you're losing your faith. It just means that we're asking questions and that's what grief is. Yes. I love that so much. So buffalo. I should have a future. I'm a buffalo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Definitely oh. brand that. It's so good. It's so good. And I've learned that in my own life. Um, just having sat with grief for over 30 years and now only the last four years starting to unpack all the loss. And mm, so. Because you lost your sister. I lost yeah. Half of my immediate family, so my dad, two of my sisters, babies lost sent to stillbirth and miscarriage, and the murder of my nephew. So it's been a, a lot of loss, succession of losses, like, but didn't know how to grieve and, and stuff, most, most, mostly all of it, just not knowing how. And so, but learning yes. how, you know, it, it's funny that you said, you know, the buff, just being like the buffalo when you. When you're able to face it head on, it does in a healthy way. It does. I don't want to say, I don't know what the word is. It is a passing through, but you're able to move forward. Yeah, for sure. You know? And, and so, I think, you know, there's a fear. There's always a fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, there was always a fear that if I faced it, it would overwhelm me. Yeah. You know, a bit like a tsunami. If, if you actually let it hit you, you'd just mm -hmm. be flat. But actually it doesn't. It it kind of comes and it recedes yes. and, and also just having the strength and the confidence not to care mm. that other people, you know, whether you, whether you cry in front of people, whether you lament in front of people, whether you take time off, it's actually about what you need. And there's no right or wrong way, as we know, right. no yeah. right or wrong way. But I do think I bless people with a healthy grief now. And mm. for me, that is helping them to feel what they feel, say what they say, what they want to say. And for me just to hold it and hold space for them. Oh, it's so good. It's just so good. and so rich. You've said so much, but I wanted to allow yeah, space. Yeah, I've, I've talked too much. No, it's just so good. It's so I good. To my five-year-old self when we say in my school. She talks too much. Oh, it's so good. I with, my, to... with the clients, I, I say very little. Yes. Well, this is your time to talk, so I'm glad you're talking because it's such a wealth of knowledge. And it, like I said, it's so rich in just everything you said in these moments have, I know, are going to help so many and going to strengthen them in their faith and just spur on hope. So I'm so, again, just so grateful for you and, and the work that you do. I want, I want to leave with um, just a few things. If you can just leave us with words of hope for the listeners today. Of course. I mean, words of hope, hope is our anger. I think the scripture in Thessalonians, you know, which says, we do not grieve like the world with no hope. For me, I felt for years, it was like, we do not grieve full stop. Yes. But there is no full stop. We do not grieve like the world with no hope, but we do grieve. And I think that's the difference. We do grieve. We can get through grief healthily, but we also have that duality or the hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life, the hope of a reunion and, and knowing that God is that anchor. And when we don't feel hope, this is where others can hold the hope. I often say to people, if you feel hopeless, you know, I will just hold the hope until you can feel it again. I'll hold the light until you feel it again. And so... Find people, I would encourage people to find people that can hold your hope if you're feeling hopeless. If you're feeling like you can't see forward, somebody that will hold the light for you because you will feel it again and hope does come up. Hope does rise. But hope is a person and peace is a person. It's not a thing. So when we pray and we just say, help God, you know, he comes in his personhood and he is our hope our restoration and our redemption. And so I would love to encourage everybody just to hold on, hold on to 
the hope of the person of Jesus Christ. So beautiful. So beautiful. So now how can, let us know, how can we connect with you across social and just hear more of your words of wisdom? So I, I'm on Facebook as Life Loves Hope and I do videos on YouTube, different subjects. So the, the most recent one is, you know, why is grief so lonely? Because that has been a massive subject. It's the hardest thing that people can struggle with, particularly after the loss of a spouse, partner. So that's the latest video that I put up there. I've got another one coming up very soon about identity. You know, who am I? Who am I after loss? Because we do change fundamentally. Our identity is very, uh, is contained in so many things, as you know, from what we do with our job to who we love, to where we live. And when all, when all of that changes, we can end up thinking, you know, who am I? Yeah. Um, so I've done one on that subject as well. So I try to connect with subjects that people bring up in sessions and that I've had to deal with myself. So you can connect with me at Life Loves Hope or on YouTube, on Facebook. And I am thinking about writing a book, but at the moment, it's all just bubbling there. But Well, I personally cannot wait for your book. <laughs> I love everything that you're doing right now with the YouTube channel and just across social. It's one of you as well, because I, I love, I mean, I don't even really know how I found you or began to find your, your stuff online, but I just love it. It felt like my heart just went ding connected with how you see things, how you are, and you know, your work has been an inspiration and the title of your book has certainly been an inspiration to me to start doing something and um, putting pen to paper and just getting stuff out there so thank you as well and isn't it wonderful yeah the sisterhood of christ and the hope of christ and yeah just our stories and we all feel the same thing yes yes absolutely thank you so much sarah for your time and for sitting with me today thank you i'm very very honored and uh, yeah just bless you all that brings me to the end of this episode. Thanks again for joining me and thanks for listening to you. Can you just sit with me? If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to come back for my next episode of Can You Just Sit With Me? Until then, this is Natasha Smith, helping you to find hope in grief, hope in the hard place, and hope in the challenging times of life. Be sure to connect with me across social media Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at I'm Natasha Smith.